and welcome to our series, Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative. I'm Russell Robinson, Chief Executive Officer of Jewish National Fund USA. The time has come to be the voice of what Zionism really is. We're exposing the beautiful and diverse facets and facts of Zionism. Join me on this journey, together with Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative, this is Zionism. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another great episode of Conversation About Zionism. I'm super excited to... Uh, have three amazing culinary figures who are also three amazing friends, so that makes it even better uh, to talk about a lot of things of food and Israel and Zionism. And to get going, just a quick introduction. My name is Lior Lebser Kars. I'm a chef and spice blender located in New York City. I have a company called La Boite, blending spices and importing them. And I'm also the co-founder of the Galilee Culinary Institute by JNF. I'm joined today by three uh, amazing uh, figures, as I said earlier. The first one, Adina Sussman, uh, who is the author of Sababa, Fresh uh, Sunny Flavors from My Israeli Kitchen, which was named a Best Fall 2019 cookbook by the New York Times, Bon Appetit and Food and Wine. She currently is living in Israel and working on her next cookbook called Shabbat to be released uh, next year. She's the co-author of 15 cookbooks, most recently, Gazoz, all about the culture of sparkling seltzer-based drinks in Israel. Adina made Aliyah in December of 2018. She cooks and writes in Tel Aviv, where she lives in the shadow of the city's Carmel Market with her husband, Jay Shoffet. You can follow her on Instagram at Adina Sussman, very easy, where she shares her culinary adventures from Israel. We also have with us Gail Simon today. Um, Gail's is a culinary expert, food writer, and a dynamic television personality. She's a permanent judge on Bravo's TV's Amy and James Beard award-winning series, Top Chef. Now in its 19th season, Gail is also the co-host of The Good Dish, the new daily syndicated series offering delicious recipes, real-life wisdom, and conversations on the topics of the day, and most recently was host of Top Chef's Amateur, as well as Iron Chef Canada. Gay lives with her family in Brooklyn, New York. And last but definitely not least, Chef Michael Solomonov who was born in Israel and raised in Pittsburgh. At the age of 18, he returned to Israel with no Hebrew language skills, taking the only job he could get working in a bakery in his culinary career was born. A champion of Israel, extraordinary, diverse, and vibrant culinary landscape. There are no culinary awards Mike hasn't won. Along with the famous Zahav, his built restaurants includes Federal Donuts, Dizengoff, Abe Fisher, Goldig Farm Merkaz, and Laser Wolf, and just recently Laser Wolf Brooklyn. Today, he can most often be found covered in flour, working the bread stations at Zahav Open Kitchen in Philadelphia. So welcome, everybody. Very excited. Uh, and to get going... Um, Adina, we'll start uh, with you. You moved to Israel uh, to write cookbooks and on Israeli food. Why did you go this path, if I can, and what does it mean to you? And what do you want people to know about Israel? Well, I often say that I moved to Israel for love, but I stayed for the shook. Um, <laughs> I met my now husband about seven and a half years ago, and we got married in Tel Aviv, an epic wedding with lots of fresh pita. <laughs> um, and I had been writing about Israeli food for a long time, um, but never really felt entitled to write a book about Israeli cooking until I was living in Israel. So I was really fortunate once I moved there that I was sort of in situ living within a stone's throw of the Carmel market. And I really wanted to present a home cook's perspective on the cooking of Israel for home cooks, uh, primarily in the United States. So I took all the ingredients and all the traditions um, that I had known and also was learning every day, both through my journeys in the Shuk and cooking with people and just eating all over Israel. And I tried to convert that into something 
that uh, people could use every day at home to find new ways to sort of be inspired and reinvigorated by the incredible diversity and richness of Israeli food. So that's kind of how Sababa came to be. And uh, it's been an amazing journey seeing people cook from the book um, and um, get excited about these ingredients that we are all so passionate about and to see Israeli food really be an ambassador for this place all over the world. That's amazing. And, you know, when you meet somebody now, what's kind of the first thing that you tell them about Israel, you know, to kind of get them excited? Um, that not everyone is a terrible driver. <laughs> I tell them that every level of food from the coffee to the breakfast sandwich you get at the local, um, you know, joint around the corner to, you know, now sort of eight San Pellegrino restaurants of the top 50 restaurants in the Middle East, like the quality level is extremely high. People are super committed to what they're serving you. It's part of a culture of hospitality and freshness and, you know, nowness that I think Israel does really well. And nothing sits in the vitrina or in the hummus pot or, you know, on the pass for too long. Everything is bright and sunny and fresh and vegetable forward and just feels very vital and, and alive. So I think the food is very much um, sort of a metaphor for, for life in Israel and, and for Israelis. Sure, oh, that's great. So Michael, um, you just came back from a, a great tour, I know, because I watched you through social media with a group of people, I believe from the United States, maybe even uh, for Canada. You know, when, when you go with groups like that to Israel, what what would you like for them to to take home with them as as memories and culinary souvenirs and you know uh, the bigger i guess question following that is what does israeli cuisine means to you uh that's a great question i mean i think that the the you know the question is sort of the answer what i want is for people to discover and to see israel through the lens um of culture or food and to constantly ask that question. The thing about Israel is that it's always evolving and it's always changing. And as Adina was referring to like, the, you know, these like San Pellegrino lists of these like new cool restaurants, but then there's the new cool restaurants that have been around for 80 years that I've never even heard of. And I know I travel to Israel all the time. I know a lot about Israeli food and I'm always at every single trip. I never, um, never let down there's always something that i haven't eaten there's something that i haven't seen there's a culture um either diasporic or indigenous uh that is that is uh, has a new representation of food that i haven't eaten um and that's what i want anybody that's ever been to israel knows you, you drop them there for 24 hours and they have a new understanding or appreciation of it so israeli cuisine for me is 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 a form of advocacy for israel and um it doesn't take very long for people to sort of understand why it's such a special, very misunderstood, um, pluralistic place. And and since we're talking about just a very quick note, do you think that part of it is, it's an ongoing debate? You know, uh, we, I'm sure you get this question three times a week is, what is Israeli cuisine? It's, it's ever evolving. The players are um, people who've been there, uh, countries that neighbor Israel, the influences, do you feel also, and feel free to jump in, that do you feel the same about this ongoing discussion of where it came from? That There's no right or wrong, it's just having a conversation. I think that there is a right, and I think that that is maybe the big thing, and, and that's probably really why we're all here, is I, I think that there is definitely a right. There is, there is Israeli cuisine, there is Israel, there is Israeli culture. Uh, it encompasses 2,000 years of diasporic history. It encompasses, enc encompasses indigenous uh, Palestinian cuisine from uh, the Galilee, from uh, the West Bank or Palestine, from Gaza, uh, Druze cooking that is part of the greater Levant, all the Levantine, all the um, uh, trade in between the Silk Road and the Spice Route, and uh, ancient winemaking, modern winemaking, and ancient and modern agriculture. And, you know, all of those things sort of put together. Every Shabbat meal that you've ever had in Israel that has four different sets of grandparents that come from different places, every argument that we've had politically about conflict and commonality, that's all Israeli cuisine.
So Gail, as the uh, you know media person in the group today, and and doing so many things in media, and and talking about you know um, in the self-proclaimed Zionist, and and you've been speaking and being very vocal about it. The, the media world doesn't necessarily always portray you know Zionism in, in the most friendly or positive way. What does it look like for you? Uh, a big question. I <clears throat> I'm not Israeli, but I'm certainly proud to be Zionist. I grew up in Canada in a um, you know in a conservative Jewish home where Zionism was a big conversation and and important to my family. I spent a lot of time learning about it, traveling to Israel as a child with my family, going back as a young adult working on a kibbutz to, um, you know, to participate and, and contribute. And then also as a culinary professional so that I can understand it through the lens of food and take that information back into my work. And I feel like the idea of Zionism is largely misunderstood, especially in this moment in the world of social media where information travels so quickly, but also gets cut up and, uh, regurgitated incorrectly so often. So I feel like my role where I can is to patiently and sometimes um, with a little more courage than I wish I needed to have, explain and amplify the idea of Zionism and the idea of Israel as um, a state that has just as much a right to exist in and of itself as anywhere else in the world. And even in some ways, uh, more so to the people who are there because so many people who come to Israel are there because they aren't able to be anywhere else. And they bring with them their food and their traditions and their culture. And that is something to really cherish and and to appreciate more than anything else. No, yeah, that's, that's great. And uh, a question for all of you, so feel free to jump in. I mean, we've all seen, you know, Israeli cuisine becoming a thing. Um, sometimes it's funny to see Israeli restaurants where you're not so sure what they know about it, but it's great. I think, again, it's the conversation that matters. Uh, so as you see all of that awareness and growth and explosion in, you know, tourism for Israeli cuisine, do you think that, you know, it, it helps reflect a better image? What does it mean to you kind of uh, as, as great ambassadors of, of Israeli cuisine? I think that tourism and awareness are, are kind of the most important things that we can do. Uh, you know, I, Getting into political debates, debates with people that have no idea or understanding or care to understand history is kind of futile. To me, <clears throat> contributing to the, you know, 75% rise in tourism into Israel because food now, um, having thousands of people come in and, in and out of our restaurants, um, with an idea of Israel that maybe been in that before or, or not, or just saying, wow, when I see the word Israel in the news or in media, I think of things like shakshuka, like borekas, like bamba, instead of um, political implications that are not accurate is, is a win. So I think that, you know, all of it is important. Um, we just led a tour, as you said, recently, and that was, you know, contributing almost half a million dollars into Israeli hospitality and tourism, which has been, which has been hurt, which is the leading industry in Israel. Um, and, you know, the idea that, that non-Israeli restaurant operators are opening in Israeli restaurants is the coolest thing ever. It is so cool. Nobody can pronounce skug properly, but besides that, it's the coolest thing ever. Um, so I think it's, it's a, it's a huge time, uh, it's a huge time for that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, when you when people in the United States and around the world talk about Israel, it's very hard for them to form opinions on their own. There's so much coming at them on so many different levels from so many different sources, as Gail said. And, you know, having a plate of Israeli food or, or setting foot in the country is an entry point to self-discovery and what, you know, used to be sort of common practice, which was, you know, making decisions for yourself, you know, check, le learning, absorbing information, um, you know, fielding different points of view. And then maybe there's, a, there's no answer, but there's like a, a deep and wide conversation that goes on. And I think that once people come to Israel and, and see it, it's just completely, uh, what I hear more than anything else is I had no idea. I had no idea. They say I had no idea about the food, but what they're really saying is I had no idea about this place. 
I had no idea how the government works. I had no idea how this place is situated geographically. As Michael said, if, if food can bring people here and can can open their eyes and most importantly, just encourage them to continue exploring it for themselves after they go home, that is a huge, you know, a huge win for Israel. And just even just, you know, the way that we explore France, the way that we explore Spain, the way that we explore any other country is the way that people should be exploring Israel as well. I, I also think that the beauty of of um, the media right now is that if you aren't able to travel, and certainly over the last two years, we've all been not been able to travel a lot less than in the past, um, the same way that America has so beautifully translated and integrated concepts of cuisine from all over the world, the same thing has happened with Israeli food here. And there are so many touch points here that people can can absorb and learn and, and help the conversation, right, about the culture, about, about the daily moments in Israel that make it so special and so unique from everywhere else in the world. And I think that that becomes something that is really universal. And if people here can understand the humanity of Israel, and that is so easily explained through its food and through its sort of daily rituals of eating, then that, you know, becomes something really identifiable and, uh, and, and really personal, regardless of if you are able to go to Israel or not. So I think that for me, hearing all of that, there's a sense of like, you know, Israeli cuisine or Israel being as a unifying thing that you bring people together literally around the table, around a conversation. I don't know if you share the same kind of sentiments. And if you have a moment or two from, you know, your past or like recent past of moments like that, of, of seeing Israeli cuisine as a unifying element. I feel like the reason that we're here the reason that we're discussing it is because we feel unified, but also maybe in defense, right? That's what it is. I mean, it could be unifying to people like us that, that um, I think understand and that advocate. It can be unifying and very polarizing. Sure. Right? You think that there's a group of American chefs that are talking about uh, defending the American values because of food? No, it's a complete double standard. And that's, that's why we're here. So it's unifying to us because we know that this is what we have to do to advocate for like the Jewish homelands, right? And without the Jewish homeland, personally, unrelated to maybe what we're discussing, Jews aren't necessarily safe in the world, right? This is the reason that we have to, that we have to discuss these things, the reason that we have to spend our time educating, and which is the reason that we have to advocate for, for um, what should be seemingly something very agreeable to all. I think, Mike, you hit it on the head, just the idea of this double standard, of this idea that Israel contains multitudes, and it is what makes it a unique, extraordinary place that has the resilience, um, you know, more so than any other country in the world in so many ways. And as the American experience is similar, I think that's that universal unifying moment that we as chefs or culinary professionals can talk about the American experience in the context of Chinese American, Italian American, um, Jewish American, so too can we talk about that in relation to the Israeli experience and that, and that it can be so many different layers of things. It can be complex and that itself is unifying and relatable, I think, to everybody. Agreed. And I, you know, what I try to do every day on my social media and in my books and in conversations that I have is just to show people that I'm living in Israel. I'm a Jew living in Israel. I'm like you living in your country. We are all just living our lives. We are not that exceptional in a lot of ways. We're just people cooking, eating, loving, working, doing all the things that people do all in all the other places in the world. And, you know, I think that food helps us sometimes get a little bit outside of that defensive crouch that we often feel that we need to be in or where we get backed into some sort of a corner. And, you know, by feeding people and, you know, eating with people. I mean, for me, for instance, you know, when I moved to the Carmel market, I didn't realize that almost half of the people who work in the market, or at least like a third of them are Muslim. And so on Muslim holidays, 
the Shuk is quite empty. It's a way for me to learn about other cultures, even though this is technically the Jewish state. It's the state of multitudes, as Gail said. And, you know, there's so many examples of culinary and cultural coexistence that go on every day in Israel that people do not see. So much micro collaboration, conversation, things that happen within this country that living here, I've been able to see and I view it as my responsibility to share that with the rest of the world. And that's just what I try to do and what we all think try to do through our work. And, you know, being here, that's been a big privilege and a big opportunity for me personally. There's no better gift to give or receive than one that can connect you with nature and your homeland. JNF has made it super easy for you to order your tree certificate online. Just go to jnf.org slash trees, pick which special occasion it's for, order your tree online, and let's get planting. Every tree counts. I think two things personally is A, for me, connecting with more culinarians in the U.S., who have an angle of Israeli cuisine, whether they're Jewish or not, it doesn't matter, but us having a conversation, uh, that was one thing. And also connecting with people outside. I was in an event not too long ago, clearly next to somebody who we didn't share anything in common. From a social perspective, financial, we had nothing in common and we nearly parted way until the point that that person asked where I'm from. I was like, I'm from Israel. In three seconds, um, they they had the biggest smile on their face and it was like, I can cook Israeli food. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. And that was it. We were the best friends ever without sharing anything in particular. So I think that was a great moment. I was like, okay, we're, we're getting somewhere. And wanted to ask, also elaborate on that. So since we're seeing all of that happening, do you feel that we're maybe on the path of, of getting a little bit of a better image and some recognition, you know, without necessarily accepting or agreeing on everything, but at least kind of finding a, a bigger conversation uh, through this, you know, Israeli food and at least getting people to be able to see the way that and, and have maybe a, a better opinion. In small ways, yes, I think that is our job, our duty um, in, in the roles that we have. Um, but there is this real dichotomy right now where on the one hand the food of Israel is more um, accepted than ever but violence and anti-semitism is also on the rise and how do we um, reconcile those things Um, and how and so that to me is is you know the hardest part about it Um, not that I don't want to be optimistic and I do feel like there is so much that the world has learned and that we will try every day to do better. And food, I think, is that way in, that universal way in, for sure. Yeah, I, I sort of second that. I, I think everybody on this call, including you, Lior, is not going to stop advocating for the country that we believe in, where we're all from. It is an uphill battle. Um, and I think that the double standard against Israel is something real and is not new. This has been happening for thousands of years and maybe that's why it's so important for us to be vocal or um, continue to sort of advocate. It would be a lot easier if we just didn't care, but the reality is, um, you know, the sort of double standard that we experience uh, is something that, you know, is probably not going to go away. So. Um, I think that, yeah, on one hand, food and culture and the promotion of those things and those values are, are, are things as values is very, very important. Um, when it's a community of chefs that are fighting against, you know, huge TV networks that are trying to sell stories and newspapers and so on and so forth. And then, you know, worldwide sort of anti-Semitism, it, it, gets, it, is, it is daunting. As Gail said, though, it's not, we're not going to stop. No, and I think it's really important, especially for younger Jews in the United States right now, to see us be proud of our provenance and our culture and of Israel. And, you know, 
there's a lot of pressure right now um, to uh, to disown Israel and to condemn Israel and, you know, just showing younger college age and high school age students, you know, that we love this place and it's not a perfect place, but neither is the place where you live, wherever you live. <laughs> and it doesn't preclude you having an identity and a culture and, um, and a race where you're from and your thousand years heritage. So, you know, we're all doing that in our own way. And, you know, yes, it's fun. Yes. Uh, it's brought a lot of us, you know, success and, and recognition and all those things. And, you know, I really just want to acknowledge all three of you because long before I got into writing about Israeli food and living in Israel, you've all been doing this and just, you know, showing people what it means to be a proud Jew and, and to be proud of supporting Israel. And it's very inspiring for me. So thank all of you, but we just all need to keep doing it and teach the younger people that it's okay to do that and that they should. No, I think so. I think that if, you know, I, I would ask all of you, I asked myself that, you know, 30 years ago, maybe, you know, 35 years ago without revealing the age here, but, um, if, if I was first, I was going to be cooking professionally, but through the career of cooking and, and doing a bunch of other things would be able to add any values to, to Israel. I, I think to me, it's, it's mind blowing that we're able to do what we love and we're passionate about. And, and through that, tell a story through this idea of, of food and the ingredients and, and the people behind the food, which I think is one of the most fascinating, the, 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 the culinary scene in Israel and the farmers. And like you said, Adina, you know, the impact of, of the different communities and cultures and religion and how it's all doesn't always weave in perfectly, but it's a work in progress, which should probably be the sign at Ben Gurion Airport is welcome to Israel, a work in progress as, as a you know secondary line. Um, it's not perfect, but where is a perfect? And, and I think the, the role as educators, which... Uh, I think young chefs or young culinarian in school should really see this as not only preparing a great dish, but the responsibility that comes with it about. Yeah. And that if you, yeah, if you see like, for instance, you know, the hottest, one of the hottest restaurants in New York right now is Laser Wolf. And also we have Chiquette, which is, you know, we have a Pakistani Italian female chef cooking some of the best Israeli food in New York city. And how did that happen? She came to Israel. <laughs> She was, she came with her friend Danielle Rayfeld and toured the place, ate everything she could see and drank everything she could drink and was really inspired. And, you know, I think that, you know, that's wonderful. You know, not every chef in the United States who's cooking Italian food has to be from Italy, as we were talking about. And, you know, Israel, Israel is a culture that can, you know, cast its web than just us and have an impact and also just like share its goodness through other people who just enjoy it. You know, it doesn't have to be more complicated than that all the time or so heavy and loaded. So like, that's a great example to me of what visiting Israel and, and loving the food and the place can, you know, and, and taking that back to the United States, what that can do. Yeah, I think so too. It's definitely, um, it's a state of mind. I mean, the fact that, you know, you take Aisha or other things, once you get into that state of mind, and I think that's one great thing about Israeli food in Israel, it, it's the welcoming aspect. It doesn't matter who you are, or where you're from, you can join the movement of, of what Israeli food and, and Israeli is. Um, I think it's go way deeper than, than where you were born. So I think mm -hmm. that's, that's just great. Um, any you know, before we, uh, this, any other thoughts of something you'd like to share about, you know, what Israeli food, Israel mean to you or things that, you know, you hope would happen, you know, in the next couple of years or even more? I just, I wanted to say, and this is echoing really what you've all said, that anyone who thinks that food is not political, I think really needs to think about the ecosystem of the world, right? And I think that um, a big lesson to me in having a platform to speak about any issue is to speak with intention and thoughtfulness about the things that matter most to me. Um, and, and that absolutely unequivocally to me includes Israel. And so 
um, understanding that being able to advocate for something beautiful and and often largely unknown to the audience that I speak to on a regular basis is really exciting, but it also comes with great responsibility. That's something that I am like really proud to be able to be a part of. Um, but, you know, to, to your point, did I ever think I would be in a role that allowed me to do that or even that that would be something I would have the courage to do? No, but I feel like now is the moment when we don't, um, if we feel strongly about the lives of the people living day to day in Israel, this is the moment we have, we have a, an opportunity to, um, to share and to educate. And I think we have a responsibility in this moment to spread love and deliciousness more than hate. And that is um, an occasion I'm happy to rise to. And I, I want to just say, I agree completely. And I think that also just keeping it personal, telling people why you love this place, telling people your history with Israel, sharing your own story is the most powerful way to convey, you know, when you're stepping on someone else's soapbox and trying to tell their story, it's not as effective. So just everyone keep talking about anyone who's listening, who's been here, who, you know, don't, you don't need to defend. You just need, like Yale said, just share the love, show the love for this place. Like that's the most effective and, and authentic way to, to, to help Israel. I think. I mean, it's hard. I, I think there's a, Gail and Adina just, just nailed it. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think that we all, We've all had separate conversations whenever there's anything political happening. And I do this with Adina all the time. And I text Gail randomly when I have like articles where I'm like, can you believe this? You know? And I do the same thing with you, Lior. And in general, I think we're all on the same page. We could have different opinions, but the idea that we also felt affected by, by this and sort of what other people's opinions are about this place that we're from is really something. I will say before this about Shuket. We had an Israeli, we had the opening of Laser Walls, which is a Chipudia here in Brooklyn. And we had this Israeli that was sitting there. Um, and he and I went to the same boarding school, actually, in Israel at, at different times. And he was like, yeah, this is pretty good, but have you been to Shuket? And I was <laughs> like, I have not been to Shuket. And he was like, yeah, he's got a great spin on all this stuff. Basically, like, this, your food is okay, but you got to go to Shuket. And I was like, you know, to have a recommendation from an Israeli to um, go to a restaurant, an Israeli restaurant run by uh, like a Pakistani chef who's not Jewish is like, it could not be as cool as that. Like there's nothing better than that. Yeah. I, you know, the fact that, you know, people want to be part of it, duplicate, mimic, you know, steal, copy, you name it. I, were, I think it's just a great proof that we're onto something good. Well, I think that, and that, and sort of uh, to to bring it to why we're here, I think that once it's okay for people publicly to advocate or to say, you know what, like let's talk about the you know this sort of political or social argument or discussion. I think that hopefully this is like the step for advocacy, so it's not just the same people are not just Israelis, they're not just Jews that are. Um, you know, they're advocating for this, like, democratic, fantastic, progressive country. Listen, we're using the word Zionism, which theoretically should be moot, right? Zionism was a, was a movement. Israel exists and has for nearly 75 years in its modern form, right? And we still, we were still having conversations over and over again about, uh, about, about this sort of right to exist in this, um, this validity of culture and history and, and uh, governance and, and all and, and, and land and all the stuff, you know? It is always a work in progress, but everyone is a work in progress. And every country has layers of, of history that are complex and imperfect. And all we can do is hope to evolve um, and not go backwards. And we do feel in Israel, certainly, that we are constantly defending that right. And that's important. And if we can, and, and if we can help to move forward and to evolve, um, then, then that's what I want to do. No, absolutely. Amen. Amen to that. So Amen. I, I, I want to thank you all. This, is, this has been amazing and, and hoping for many, many more 
conversations, debates, you know, positive arguments around food that have a bigger message and, and really want to thank you uh, for doing what you're doing. And like Adina says, just being who you are, that that's all it takes and, and the rest will follow. So thank you very much. To watch this and all of our past episodes, go to ZTV, our Zionism Studios YouTube page and subscribe to get notifications.